Thanks very much. I have to say I felt kind of a little bit weird to invite myself to this workshop as an invited speaker. <laughs> Um, but Tim, you know, the, the president of the Society for Mathematical Psychology was very um, convincing and I didn't want to argue with the president too much. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go for it. So, so yeah, I'm excited to share uh, some work that has come out of my lab with you and uh, under the umbrella, under the theme of the role that counterfactual simulation plays in causal cognition. So not too far from here at Stanford University, I lead what's called the Causality and Cognition Lab. And we're interested in, so very fitting for this workshop, I would think, <laughs> um, the role that causality plays in people's understanding of the world and of each other. So we're interested in how people learn about the causal structure of the world. Many of the talks have, have focused on that theme. Also, like, like with Noah's talk just now, how once we have a model of the world, how we can use it to reason about the world, make predictions, make inferences, think about how the world could have played out differently from how it actually did. And then also how those capacities sort of like play into the judgments that we make in our everyday lives, such as assigning responsibility to each other. And so assigning responsibility is really one sort of the unifying themes and that I believe my lab is working toward. Um, and maybe with a higher level goal of developing a computational framework for understanding how it is that people assign responsibility. And to get there, we have to answer at least these two questions, one of which being what causal role somebody's action played in bringing about the outcome. And then the other one being what we can learn about the person from having observed their action. Right? And we need some intuitive theory of how the world works for that first part. So we can reason about the causal effects that the action that somebody had you know, on, on the world or on other people. And then we need an intuitive theory of how people work. It's also something I think that Samantha mentioned in, in her talk. So we can reason backwards from the actions that we observe others taking to the kind of mental states that gave rise to that, whether they believe, whether they intend, what were their capacities. So I'm a psychologist by training, right? And when I got into psychology, social psychology was my favorite um, uh, topic. And somehow responsibility was my favorite topic too. Maybe that was just because I had worked on a group and I didn't get a lot of credit for the group output. And I thought, oh, that wasn't fair. Like someone should study this. <laughs> and then I guess I did it myself. And the kind of models that I saw at the time, you know, and they still exist and they're very valuable to sort of take that form, right? Where people have identified the kind of factors that are relevant. They've also, um, they're not quite as complicated as some of the ones that Samantha uh, threw up, but still sufficiently complicated. Um, some relations between them, right? And there's many different versions like thereof. Um, but then Bertram Muller uh, uh, um, uh, argued at some point, right, saying that um, a big limitation of these kinds of models is that they don't really make any quantitative predictions, right, and that's where I thought I'll come in, the sort of nerdy social psychologist I am, and the um, parts that I thought, like, where I could get started is, like, um, causality, because all of these models on responsibility, they have causality in somewhere, right, because there is a sense in which we can really only hold somebody responsible if their action had something to do causally with, with the outcome. So that was my, my starting point. Okay, let's try to understand that first and then move our way up from there. And so there are two, three key ingredients um, that I think are, are, are necessary to try to understand at least how it is that people are making causal judgments in the world. And I'm mostly going to be focusing on causal judgments about particular events. So not the kind um, that um, Rich focused on where we have correlational evidence, but rather it's just one thing that we observed in the world and we were interested in um, why that happened or who was responsible or to what extent somebody was responsible for that thing happening. So the ingredients that we need is a, a mental model of the world. I already alluded to this kind of intuitive theory of physics or psychology, the ability to perform counterfactual interventions like on that model, and then the ability to simulate what the, kind of, what the consequences of these counterfactual interventions would have been. And so I'm going to try and illustrate that now with these two parts. So part one, really focusing on the simple causal model of the physical world. And then in part two, sharing some work where I'm extending it to um, thinking about uh, assigning responsibility to agents in still simple scenarios, but helping and hindering one another. OK, let's start with that first part. So how do people make causal judgments about um, physical events? The reason why I got into physics was that at the time when I when I started being interested in these kinds of questions, physics engines had just come around, right? So I was at a postdoc in Josh Tannenbaum's lab at MIT, and Angry Birds was sort of happening on your phone at the time, if you remember that. But it also led to a sort of a revival of work in intuitive physics in psychology, because now it was much easier to do physically realistic, create physically realistic stimuli than it had been in the past, right? And so they were doing a lot of work on intuitive physics at the time in the lab there at MIT. And I thought, oh, maybe I can also use this to study causality. And then I came up with this um, setup here and you're gonna be my participants now. So there'll be two balls coming into the scene, sort of balls. And I'll ask you whether you think that ball A caused ball B to go through the gate here on the left-hand side. And 
And then if you think the answer is yes, maybe you raise your hand. Okay, so a lot of people think so. Um, what did you do, right? So you obviously took into account or looked at what actually happened, right? But the, and that the balls collided and that it ended up going, going in. And then there's some the philosophical- causes, The cause is the programmer. The cause is the programmer, okay. <laughs> we have, luckily we have a panel in a bit, so we can, we can get back to that. <laughs> Also relevant for AI and ethics. And so, <laughs> um, so, and the key claim is, right, you can probably tell it's not the full picture. There's another part that that's not enough, right? Some philosophers and also some psychologists have argued that's all you need. All the information is present in order to make causal judgments in the actual, in the actual world, right? But the key claim here is to say that's not the case. What you also all sort of intuitively did is you didn't just look at what actually happened. You also used your intuitive understanding of this simple physical domain um, to simulate what would have happened in the relevant situation. And in this case, the relevant counterfactual for you is the world in which you had imagined removing ball A from the scene and then simulating where the ball would have ended up, right? So that's that's the idea. And so, and it's in, in some sense then sort of an epistemic account, you might say, of your causal judgment, like to the extent that you believe that the outcome in the counterfactual situation would have been different from the one that actually happened, that determines the degree to which you say, yes, I think it caused it to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so key inspiration for this kind of work, of course, came from Pearl, right, who has um, developed different ways of representing um, our knowledge that we have of the world using causal basenets or structural equations, and then also nice formal tools for thinking about the consequences of interventions like on um, representations like that. But then one key difference is that the kind of worlds, I guess, that I'm interested in are a little bit more complicated or would at least be difficult to represent with these kind of formal tools, right? So as um, Rich was saying the program, was, which was me in this case, right? So I use a probabilistic program, so basically like a physics engine that I tweak a little bit. And I assume that's actually the model that people have in their mind. Of course, not perfectly, but that's the assumption. And then I have to think about how I now implement counterfactual interventions like on this representation, right? And maybe I can do something like help myself to a function that says, okay, you can remove some object from the scene and then replay how, it would, how the world would have played out without that object. And that's the basic yeah. idea. One thing that's nice about that is that then uh, relatively straightforwardly, we can derive um, quantitative predictions about what kind of causal judgments people should reach. And that didn't exist um, before that. We didn't have, we had nice quantitative models of how people make causal judgments from contingency information, but not really about these sort of individual kind of situations. Right? And the basic idea here is that you don't have ground access or ground truth, access to the ground truth of this case, right? You have to use your, imagination or your ability to mentally simulate to generate what would have happened in a relevant counterfactual situation. And this is where the sort of probabilistic part of the program um, enters because the physics program in some sense that I've used here is deterministic. Once the parameters are set, always the same thing would happen, right? But I assume that you have some uncertainty and one way to make the program probabilistic is just by adding a little bit of noise into the simulator, right? And this is one way to add noise, right? So I'm now saying, okay, I'm, I'm generating a sample and each time, at each time point, I wiggle the ball a little bit. So now it creates that trajectory that um, you know is a little bit wiggly. And now I might say, okay, in this case, yeah, I would have missed, right? And I can just now draw another sample and another sample, noisy sample from that simulator. And then I can just sort of count, right, in my mind. Oh, with these samples that I drew in the alternative world, how many of them would the outcome have been different from what actually happened? And in this case here, all of them. So I'm quite certain that ball A caused ball B to go through the gate because in all my noisy samples, I would have missed. But then I can uh, take another situation like this one here, where now it's a kind of close call in the counterfactual, right? And if I now generate these noisy samples again, sometimes ball B would have missed, but it's also possible that ball B would have gone in anyhow, even if ball A hadn't been present in the scene. Right? So accordingly, it should be less certain in this case that we passed into that field. So we show participants flips like that back in the experiment, manipulating here, um, in, in these cases, he always went in, but we manipulated how close it was or would have been in the counterfactual situation. Right here on the left hand side, it clearly would have missed, it was a close call, or it clearly would have gone in anyhow. And then we asked one group of participants this counterfactual question afterwards. So they showed, showed the clip and asked them, Do you think that Bob B would have missed the gate if Bob A hadn't been present in the scene? Right. And then they, they're pretty sure that it would have missed, unsure here, and pretty sure that it would have gone in in that case. And then a separate group of participants, we asked the causal question. And those participants, we didn't tell anything about counterfactuals. So we didn't tell them, hey, when you answer the question, maybe you want to consider what would have happened. We just asked them a causal question. And we found that the um, answer is very closely aligned with those of the other participants in the counterfactual condition. 
And we can also use that counterfactual simulation model, right? That adds a little bit of noise when it simulates what would have happened. And that also um, yields similar predictions to what people said. These were just three clips. Like in total, we had 18 different clips in that experiment. And we found, um, what this plot is just showing is like the average counterfactual judgments on the x-axis and the average causal judgments on the y-axis. And they're extremely closely aligned with one another. It's not really a model in some sense, because it's just to do different judgments, but really maybe illustrating that what people care about here is thinking about what would have happened in a relevant counterfactual situation. Um, some question was about, okay, um, so we, you know, we wrote this paper and then somebody was saying like, oh, but in all the clips that you showed, something different was going on. So maybe you could really come up with an account um, that can explain people's causal judgments in terms of what actually happened. You just haven't tried hard enough, right? So we tried relatively hard and didn't get it to work. But then I also thought like, okay, well, let's just do an experiment um, that would sort of put the nail on the coffin for what I call the actualist account of causation. Right? Those are people who believe you only need what, what actually happened. And so that's a round of audience participation again. And this time I'm gonna ask you whether you think that ball A prevented ball B from going through the gate. And here's what happens. So raise your hand if you think that it prevented it from going through that. So a couple of hands, but not, not that many. So here's another clip. <laughs> so if it's on Zoom, I have to tell people that it's not a glitch, but it's not on Zoom, so it wasn't a glitch. So what I did was me playing kind of portal. So this is a tenant board where if ball B goes in here, it comes out of this exit in the same way in which it entered. Right? And so if I now show you that same clip again, um, the one from earlier, you will now say, or at least my participants do, yes, it prevented it from going through, right? Nothing happened. This is, it's still the same clip that I showed you earlier, but I changed your belief about how the world works, which in this case affects what you think would have happened in the relevant counterfactual situation, right? Because now think like, oh yeah, actually, well, we would have gone in through that portal. So yes, it prevented it from going through, right? So the fact that I can show you the exact same clip um, and, change, and your judgment changes quite a lot, for me felt like, yeah, that, now, if you have an actualist account, it's not gonna it's not gonna happen. I don't need a teleport. I can also move this block in and out of the way. That's what I did here. Right. So people say that didn't don't think that it prevented it on the left. Do think that it prevented it on the right. Um, do think that it caused it when the block would have been in the way. Don't think that it caused it when the block was out of the way. Okay. Um, so just one more on that. So we can also even more directly. So the 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 model doesn't only make a prediction about the output right, that people should produce, but also how they arrive at that, namely through this process of simulating what the relevant counterfactual would have looked like. Right? And, and we can test this process level prediction by doing eye tracking, right? mm -hmm. put people for an eye tracker and see, okay, what is it that they're looking at when making causal judgments? Right. And so I'll show this clip at half speed and we have different conditions. In this experiment, we just ask participants at the end of the clip to say whether they thought that well, we completely missed the gate or went right We'll see a participant here, and this like blue dot is like their gaze position over time. So they're just looking back and forth between A and B, looking at ball B, extrapolating now a little bit of where ball B is going to end up hitting the wall. And that. So mostly looking at ball B in this case, because that's all they need to know to answer that question. If then in contrast, we ask participants a causal question about the clip. So again, depending on the outcome, and they know that they're going to be asked that question. So depending on the outcomes, either prevent or cause it, you'll see that the eye movements look very different. So they're not just looking at the balls, right? But they're trying to see where ball B would have gone if ball A hadn't been present in the scene. Right? And again, doing so without us telling them anything like about counterfactuals um, or so. So that was like a nice uh, demonstration that made me very happy at the time. Still happy, even though it's been six years. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long, long lasting happiness. <laughs> and this is just showing now from the endpoints of participant saccades. So if we take the fast eye movements and go from one point to another, where do these endpoints land? Um, taking from the time between when the balls enter and collide with one another. And we see that there are many more endpoints of saccades, basically these looks that you saw from one participant in the causal condition compared to the um, um, outcome condition. Many more green dots here. Okay. So just one or two slides about um, what about more complex situations, right? So far, there was only these two billiard balls. It will get much more complex now by adding a third billiard ball. And, and we'll get into kind of types of causation territory here. 
So here's um, um, a simple kind of causal chain situation. And if we ask participants to make judgments about this clip, they look like this. So they give like A, a pretty high causal rating, but also B gets a relatively high causal rating. And from all I've told you so far, this second part is sort of tricky to understand. Because remember, I had this remove operator. Mm -hmm. And if I remove ball B here, it makes no difference. Mm -hmm. right? Like A would have knocked E in anyhow, even if ball B hadn't present, been present in the scene. Mm -hmm. So here's another one um, that philosophers love called double prevention, where B prevents A from preventing E. Right? So it's kind of nice in physics again. If you want to make a causal graph, it gets annoying or describe it in a scenario. But here you can see it fairly quickly right? that, that what, what, what happened was that double prevention happened. Um, and if you look at that, then the judgment for ball B is very low. Even though in the counterfactual condition, if you ask them, hey, would you have gone through the gate if ball B hadn't been there? They say, no, it wouldn't have gone through the gate. So they realize that um, E depends on D being present in the scene, but nonetheless, B gets a pretty low um, rating in this case. Why so low? And so this was what I looked like, and I actually took a break from MIT and visited Noah um, at the time at Stanford and, and uh, um, you know, meditated <laughs> and um, and try to figure out okay, how do we how do we fix this? And then some inspiration, or actually maybe all of the inspiration, together with talking to Noah, um, came from reading a little bit more philosophy and even also things that have come up in Lawrence's talk earlier by thinking of causation as influence, right? So the idea is to say like, well, that maybe there are you know not fundamentally different kinds of causation, but at least different aspects of causation that we can think about by thinking about interventions on different levels in some sense of, of granularity. So this thing that I mentioned so far, let's call that weather causation. And it just says like, whether you think that the outcome would have been qualitatively different if let's say the candidate cause had not been present in the scene. Right? Would ball E have not gone in if ball A hadn't been there? Right? Um, so I can remove ball, ball B and see, okay, it wasn't the weather cause of E going through the gate in this case. Right? But maybe there's another aspect or a way that I can think about causation, what I call how causation. And the idea is here that I'm just using still my same generative model of the world. I'm still using my physics engine, but, but I'm just thinking of a different kind of intervention now on the model and thinking about what consequences that would have had. Right? And here the idea is, well, maybe let me imagine if I just perturb the world a little bit or the object in that world, if I had made a small change to ball D, which could be in place or could change its mass or something. Would that have made would that have made a difference to the outcome now more finely construed, right? To the way in which Paul he would have come through the gate. And so if I if I allow myself to, to include these two different aspects of causation in my model, right, then I can then I can help somewhat explain why we could find a pattern like this. Right? Because for well, for ball A, it was both a weather cause and a house how cause. If it hadn't been there, well, he wouldn't have gone in. And if I perturbed A a little bit, well, he would have gone through the goal go differently from how it actually did. Whereas for ball B, it was only a how cause. If it had been, hadn't been there, he would have still gone in. But if I perturbed it a little bit, um, um, he would have gone through the gate differently from how it actually did. And in this double prevention case, where we have ball B being just a weather cause, but not a how cause, even if I perturb it a little bit, he is still going to go through the gate exactly in the same way that it did. So this kind of how causation that um, is often some of the intuition that like process theories and actualist theories of, of philosophy have, that sort of my goal is saying, yeah, there is something important about this intuition, but we, we can still capture it within this kind of factual framework, just by thinking about a different kind of intervention on the model. And, and this then in general works quite well. So we showed participants a number of different clips, and this is like how a model does that only has this weather causation aspect, and then on the right-hand side, a model that has these multiple aspects can account for the data much better. Okay, so that was the um, first part, longer part. The shorter part will be part two. <laughs> um, so causal judgments are well explained by people's um, subjective degree of belief about you know, what would have happened in the relevant counterfactual situation. Um, that it seems like they're necessary for capturing people's causal judgments. That people spontaneously engage in counterfactual simulation when making causal judgments as evidence from the eye movements and that they consider different aspects of causation uh, in sort of more complicated cases. Um, this model works well for the kind of billiard ball event uh, causality um, that I've shown you so far. It also can capture people's judgments about omissive causation. So if you ask you, for example, did B go into the gate because ball A didn't hit it? You can again answer that question by simulating what you think would have happened had A hit um, ball B and how likely you think the outcome would have been different. And we can even look at situations where sort of nothing is happening at all, right? If you think about a tower of blocks, 
um, that something might always that maybe there's no causation going on because nothing is happening. But if you think of support, right, as something as a notion of that preventing from falling, then it also is a causal notion. And then you can say like, oh, how responsible is that black brick there for the other one staying there? Well, what would have happened if it hadn't been there? And it gives you a sense of degree of support that it lends to the structure. Okay, so that was the causal stuff. And I did the causal stuff because physics engines were around, right? I was, I'm still very much more interested in people than in billiard balls. <laughs> um, but it was just something that I was able to do, you know, at the time. And then one of the perks, I guess, of coming to um, Stanford is that you get to work, you know, with really smart people. And then you can actually, you know, take these ideas and explore to, to what extent they also work well in a, in a social setup, where now you need to think about intentions and planning and things like that. So that I will tell you a little bit about in the remaining five minutes, I think, that I have. Um, so this is work by, by Sarah, who is here, um, and also um, my PhD student, and also um, Shruti Srita, who's an um, um, undergraduate, um, who's been with us now for, for a number of years helping that, that project. So we're interested in helping and hindering. And helping and hindering has a long tradition, of course, in, in psychology. This is just an example from Toma Oman's work back from 2009. But they also use these simple kind of grid game environments and ask participants to infer what somebody's agent's goal was, right? whether their goal was to help or to hinder. Right? And the sort of basic idea was to say, well, what does it mean to intend to help? Well, it means that you're placing like a positive utility on the other person's utility. Right? And when you want to intend to help, hinder, you have a negative utility on the other person's um, utility. But one key sort of observation is that like intending to help or hinder is not the same as actually helping or hindering. And this is just the example that I use here. I don't have uh, children yet, but uh, many of you who have children have probably had children who helped you with the groceries, right? Where the intention was probably there, but like they made it worse, right? As in, like, you know, it took longer. And so it wasn't helping in the sense and like making it more efficient, making it easier, whatever, right? Hopefully, eventually they will grow up to be amazing helpers, but not maybe at that time. So, and the claim is right to actually judge whether somebody was helped or hindered is a counterfactual term, right? Is it like, was it better that it would have been otherwise? And we studied this in this simple um, uh, setup in this grid world here, where we have this red guy who wants to get to a star, and then this blue guy here who either wants to help or hinder red. We don't know that at the beginning. And then there are these static walls in the scene, and then there's also these blocks, but only blue can move them, right? Red's too weak in this case. And so let's see what happens in this um, scenario. This one has a happy ending. So we had, you know, red go through. And then we showed participants clips like these and asked them, oh, how responsible was blue for red success in this case? Or we would ask them, do you think that red would still have succeeded if blue hadn't been there? You see, so ask them kind of, so like the other experiment, basically, cause the question, kind of factual question. But this time we also asked them a question about the intention. So what do you think blue was actually attending to do here? Whether they definitely wanted to help or did they try to hinder? And so the idea is the same, right? It's saying, okay, we still have now, we're going to use the same tools. We have our model of the domain. In this case, now our probabilistic program is not a physics engine anymore, right? but it's a, a model of um, planning in that domain. Right? And I wasn't able to do that, but luckily Sarah and Shruti are. So they wrote planning models that you can now use to think about, oh, how would an agent have moved if the other agent hadn't been present in the scene or if they had done something different? And the idea is, right, that I can now have this generative planner and use that both for causal attribution by simulating counterfactuals and also um, for inference right, to say like, okay, um, were, were the actions that this agent took more in line with them being a helping or hindering agent? So in some sense, just by analogy, right, like the same analogy, the same sort of tool here, at least for the causal attribution part. Okay. And so for the intention inference part, just briefly about that. So in our setting, red only has the goal of reaching the star. And blue has this social goal, like of helping and hindering. And then we later also um, develop more sophisticated versions of blue where it can also have presentational goals. So he wants to be seen, or they want to be seen as being helping or hindering. Um, and then we build up uh, this model by starting with uh, basically using these recursive reasoning accounts, like K-level reasoning accounts, starting with a simple level red agent that just wants to get to the goal and doesn't think about anything else. And then see like, oh, how would a blue agent that now either wants to help or hinder respond to such a simple, you know, red level zero agent. And then we can go up the ladder, right? And say, like, oh, if they know that, um, um, if they try to infer what Blue's intention is, then they might act, you know, in accordance to that. And this is as far as we went, like a level blue agent who then also <laughs> thinks about a level two agent and so on. Okay, um, 30 seconds, so 
it will be very brief. But I would want to just give you a few examples of the kind of clips that we had in the experiment. Um, so here's one where blue is sort of extra mean by putting another block in the way. Um, here's one where um, blue is sort of maybe appearing helpful without actually making any difference. Then <laughs> um, there's a clip here where it's sort of missed coordination. Build them on the way. And then the final one here where um, blue doesn't do anything and red just um, you know, gets to the goal without. But blue could have easily prevented had they wanted to. Okay, and I'll, I'll stop in a slide. So if we just use those kind of actual judgments and try to explain responsibility judgments that way, but like we did it in the kind of billiard ball setup, this is how it works. So not, not as well, right? They're correlated, but it's not really explaining all of the variance. But if we assume that, so not a perfect match like in billiard balls world, but if we assume that people also care about like what they can learn about the agent from having observed their action, and we allow for both of these to be in the model, then we can actually explain people's responsibility judgments very well in that setup. <laughs> um, and finally, just to give you one intuition for why that's happening. Um, so in a situation like this, the one where it puts the block in front of the way, right? Um, it's clear that, well, that the red guy wouldn't have reached anyhow, right? Even if blue hadn't been present in the scene, but people can also infer that they really wanted to hinder and then they still hold them responsible for that outcome. And the last slide, um, in this situation here, blue does exactly the same thing. So people's inferences about blue's intention are exactly the same, but there's like just a little bit here missing, right? Such that red could have gone to the goal anyhow, even if blue hadn't performed that action. And that makes a big difference to the responsibility judgment. Right? So that they think, yeah, here blue is very responsible, whereas here blue is not that responsible because red could have reached that by themselves anyhow. Okay, so the conclusion slide. Um, I hope what these you know, projects have shown together is that people build these rich mental models of the world, and I illustrated it by models of physics and simple models of intuitive psychology, that we use those by then thinking about um, interventions and counterfactuals in those models and simulating what the consequences of those have been, and those are critical for giving causal explanations, and that this works still both in a kind of physical domain where we explain physical events, but also in a social domain, but where we also not only care about what, what causal consequences of somebody's actions were, but also what the actions tell us about the kind of person that they are, in this case, what intentions they had. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm having, I'm stuck. I'm just thinking of anything that helps. And I just think that the original, when I first started to build it, you asked us, did A cause B? Yeah. And I said, no, it was just cool balls, just moving and then you know, and then happened right into each other. Mm. And there was no intention or responsibility there. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what would happen if you like change the trajectory of one of them mm. to, to build in the intention that you're talking about. Really. Yeah, yeah. So most people, I should say, in that earlier case, what we saw had their hand up, right? So they did think um, that it caused it to go through, like in this purely physical case. Um, the intentions, I think, yeah, clearly matter. I mean, in, in many cases, they make the counterfactual sort of less clear, right? Because once you have an intentional agent, like, what do I know that, that they would have done, right? If something else about the world had changed. Um, so at least in the in the physics domain, right, we didn't need at least intention as a concept. Like people often say, like, oh yeah, these little balls look like little agents, right? But to explain the judgments that people reached, I didn't need that concept, right? Whereas of course in the second part, I did need it because there's no way in which I can simulate how an agent would have acted if they didn't have like intentions and plans and were acting according to those. Right. But you 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 didn't mind using a portal, right? That's right. You didn't mind it's certainly possible yeah I, I think you could rerun those experiments and make it such that one of them you know looks agentive right mm -hmm. it would just make it such that um, at least in certain cases then evaluating what would have happened in the relevant counterfactual situations will become quite hard right because now if you have an agent that can do sort of anything right and if the maybe if the target target is the yeah. agent what would I what what do I know what would have happened if that agent hadn't been hit, right? <laughs> so that's just like um, but but it can um so incorporating also like intentional agents in this sort of richer continuous spaces is something that we've been doing a little bit in some work. So there's certainly room for for meshing.